Lecture 3, Fulfillment in the New Testament Part 1, Theology of Women. The Old Testament theology of women was fulfilled in the New Testament theology of women as personified in Mary. In this lecture, we will see how Mary fulfills women and feminine aspects of the Old Testament in four ways. Mary as New Eve, Mary as the Woman of the Proto-Evangelium, Mary as Queen Mother, and Mary as Daughter Zion. Before doing so, though, we will first briefly look at key terminology that is used when explaining that the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New Testament and the New Testament is foreshadowed in the Old Testament. Typology and Allegory The words typology and allegory are often used to relate the Old Testament with the New Testament. Typology is based on the Greek word typos, which means a blow, a dent, impression, or mark. We use the base of this Greek word in typewriter, since typewriters make an impression by hitting paper with a metal hammer. According to a Catholic application of typology to the New Testament, types are in the Old Testament, and antitypes, or the fulfillment of the types, are in the New Testament. The most important antitype, which is not a negative term, it just means the fulfillment of the type, is Christ who fulfills the role of David, who's a type, Christ is the antitype, as a leader. Moses as a lawgiver, Elijah as a prophet, Melchizedek and Aaron as a priest. So, God, so Jesus, Christ, fulfills the type of David, type of Moses, type of Elijah, type of Melchizedek, and type of Aaron. Right? As uh, greater than any prophet, because he's the son of God, as the high priest, as the leader as the lawgiver in person. This does not mean, though, that typology is not pres present within the Old Testament itself. It is. In his book, Allegory and Event, Richard Hansen demonstrates that ancient Jewish rabbis conceived of Israel's redemption in the Messianic age as foreshadowed in every detail by the redemption from Egypt as its type. So the uh, prophets, they speak about this Messianic age, we see that in the prophetic literature in the Old Testament, and that would be seen as the antitype of the redemption from Egypt, where Moses leads people out, uh, his people out, to the promised land. And so, continue with Richard Hansen. As Israel was fed with rich food in the wilderness, so will God feed them at the last time. If we now apply this way of interpreting the relationship to the Old Testament to the New Testament, that is, type and anti-type, promise and fulfillment, we may conclude the following. Once the types of the Old Testament are typed on the page of the New Testament, they assume greater meaning, their fullness of meaning, including the anti-types in the Old Testament as well, since the page representing the Word of Christ bring all types of the Old Testament into their fullest relationship with one another. A related term to typology is allegory. Allegory comes from a Greek word that literally means a speaking about something else, from alos, meaning another, and agorain, meaning to speak in the assembly. Unlike typology that relates people and events horizontally through time, allegory, when it was first used, relates historical events vertically with trans-historical or spiritual realities. For example, both in Jewish and in Christian tradition, the Song of Songs has been interpreted in an allegorical manner, in which the human love portrayed in the poetry is vertically signifying the spiritual love between God and his chosen people. Beginning with Origen, Philip Carey explains, the horizontal dimension of typology became assumed under, under the vertical dimension of allegory, because Christ, by becoming incarnate, experienced time through his human nature, while transcending time as a divine person. For this reason, in Christianity, the vertical allegorical reference to the second person of the Trinity arches over all types and is integrated with them. In a way always subordinate to Christ's overarching allegorical dimension, Marian types abound throughout the Old Testament. In previous chapters, lectures, we covered a variety of specific women who are Marian types. 
These women include, but are not limited to, Eve, the woman of Genesis, Queen Mother, and Daughter Zion. Mary as do Eve. The name Eve comes from the Hebrew word Yahwa, which means a living being. The first Eve received her name because, as Genesis chapter 3 explains, the woman named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Interestingly, Ratzinger points out, Eve received her name after the fall and not before. The reason for this, speculates Ratzinger, was to affirm that the dignity and majesty of women remained after the fall of Adam and Eve. This original feminine dignity and majesty of women due to the first woman's and all other women's relationship to life, has been marred by women being, at times, a temptation for men. By being perfectly obedient to God, Mary became the new mother of the living who restores life through her son Jesus to mankind. We will see in a later lecture how early church fathers emphasized Mary's obedience. In summarizing this obedience of Mary's this understanding of Mary's obedience in salvation history, Tim Staples, alluding to scripture and to commentary of the church fathers, states that while the old Eve reached out in disobedience to the tree of knowledge of good and evil and brought death to her children, Mary reaches out in faith to the tree of salvation, uniting with her son who brings eternal life. Mary as woman of Genesis. The Proto-Evangelium, Proto-Gospel, from Genesis 3.15, was touched upon previously. According to Catholic tradition, the promised Messiah, who this verse assures will come to defeat, Satan, is Jesus Christ. Similarly, the woman of Genesis is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Their victory, though, points out St. Pope John II in Redemptoris Mater, quote, will not take place without a hard struggle a struggle that is to extend through the whole of human history. God could have chosen an easier way to victory, but as St. Augustine asserts, God created us without us, but he did not will to save us without us. End of quote. He will not save us without us since he respects our free will and wants to, us to love him freely. Mary, as Mother Redeemer, who will defeat Satan, is further explains the Holy Father. Placed at the very center of that enmity, that struggle which accompanies the history of humanity on earth and the history of salvation itself. In this central place, she who belongs to the weak and poor of the Lord bears in herself like no other member of the human race that glory of grace which the Father has bestowed on us in his beloved Son. And this grace determines the extraordinary greatness and beauty of her whole being. Mary thus remains before God and also before the whole of humanity as the unchangeable and inviolable sign of God's election, spoken of in Paul's letter. In Christ he chose us before the foundation of the world. He destined us to be his sons. This election is more powerful than any experience of evil and sin, than all that enmity which marks the history of man. In this history, Mary remains a sign of sure hope. Mary as Queen Mother in his doctoral dissertation, Queen Mother, A Biblical Theology of Mary's Queenship, Edward Sree carefully examines how Mary fulfills the Old Testament office, a queen mother that we examined earlier. In his dissertation, Sree explains that the connection between the Old Testament queen mothers and Mary as a queen mother and as the queen mother was examined with greater clarity after Vatican II when, and I quote, Many scholars addressing this topic have taken a salvation historical approach, using the Old Testament Queen Mother tradition as the primary backdrop for understanding Mary's queenship. These scholars conclude that, with this Old Testament background in mind, Mary should be understood as the Queen Mother in the new kingdom of her son. For example, in the New Testament, Mary and Jesus are shown fulfilling Isaiah 7.14, thus connecting Mary with the Queen Mother concept. Most of these scholars also point out how Mary is Queen Mother by returning to the visitation scene, where Elizabeth calls Mary the Mother of my Lord, words probably used in reference to the Queen Mother in the Old Testament. 
As Queen Mother, Mary also intercedes to her son on behalf of her people, who comprise the church. In heaven, her intercessory role, evident that at the wedding of Cana, has been intensified and not eliminated. It would not make sense for God to grant her the role of intercessor to her son, while on earth only to take this away from her in heaven. Antoine Nashif pointedly argues this point by asserting, and I quote, What would persons be if, after living an entire life dedicated to God, they would lose their identity and not remain themselves in heaven? Both the being and the action of the human person are perfected in heaven. Otherwise, there would be a lack of sincerity in the part of God, who promised to give glory according to the degree of perfection that a person reaches in this life. The promise of God and revelation that Nashef likely has in mind is from Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what he has done. In Romans chapter 2, we also read, for he will repay according to each one's deeds. To those who by patiently doing good seek glory and honor and mortality, he will give eternal life. While for those who are self-seeking and obey not the truth but wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. Similarly, Galatians chapter 6 verse 8 states, If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. According to the dogmatic teaching of the Council of Florence, these and other similar scripture passages teaches that the souls of those who have incurred no stain of sin whatsoever after baptism, as well as souls who after incurring the stain of sin, have been cleansed whether in their bodies or outside their bodies, as was stated above, are straightway received into heaven and clearly behold the triune God as he is. Yet one more person more perfectly than another, according to the difference of their merits. But the souls of those who depart this life in actual mortal sin, or in original sin alone, go down straightway to hell to be punished but with unequal pains. Similarly, the Council of Trent teaches in Canon 32 concerning justification, if anyone says the good works of the one justified are in such manner the gifts of God that they are not also the good merits of, of him justified, or that the one justified by the good works that he performs by the grace of God and the merit of Jesus Christ, whose living member he is, does not truly merit an increase of grace eternal life, and in case he dies in grace the attainment of eternal life itself, and also an increase of glory, let him be anathema. Nashif states these doctrinal teachings from the Council of Florence and Trent in more contemporary language by writing, quote, Heaven becomes the radicalization and the ultimate perfection and realization of a person's being and action on earth, end of quote. Mary's, eternal, Mary's maternal intercession while she was on earth as fulfillment of the Old Testament role of Queen Mother has consequently intensified in heaven, in a role as Queen Mother of Heaven and Earth. Mother, Daughter, Mary as Daughter Zion. The final type that we will study is the personification of Israel as Daughter Zion. As explained previously in reference to Ratzinger, the Old Testament incorporates women into its theology, not by claiming that God is married to a goddess, as pagan religions did, but rather by presenting the created corporate reality of Israel as espoused to God. The title Daughter Zion was used in the Old Testament to signify this marital relationship between God and his chosen people. For a detailed explanation from the Dominican Mark O'Brien on why the term Daughter Zion signifies the spousal relationship between God and Israel, carefully read the corresponding footnote in the uh, transcript to this lecture. There, O'Brien explains that Zion was used to refer to various aspects of the city of Jerusalem. Since the Hebrew word for city, Kirya, is feminine, it was referred to with a feminine title, Daughter Zion. This term, Daughter Zion, was understood as personifying the entire city of Jerusalem, representing God's chosen people. In prophetic literature, in particular, 
the prophet Hosea, the relationship between the chosen people and God is described in natural terms, that is, in marital terms. Hence, the relationship between daughter Zion, personifying, that is, representing the chosen people, Israel, and God was nuptially understood, was understood in a marital sense. This Old Testament nuptial mystery, writes Ratzinger, quote, acquires its definitive meaning for the first time in the New Testament, in the woman who is herself described as a truly holy remnant, as the authentic daughter Zion, and who is thereby the mother of the Savior, yes, the mother of God, end of quote. In a similar way, as the daughter Zion represents all the people of Israel, Mary personifies the people of the church. For this reason, Lumen Gentium of Vatican II names Mary the exalted daughter of Zion. St. John Paul II explains the difference between the daughter of Zion of old and the daughter of Zion who is Mary by saying, quote, with Mary, daughter of Zion is not merely a collective subject, but a person who represents humanity, and at the moment of the Annunciation, she responds to the proposal of divine love with her own spousal love. Thus she welcomes in a quite a special way the joy foretold by the prophecies, a joy which reaches its peak here in the fulfillment of God's plan. Unlike the Old Testament Zion, who was a collective subject of the people of Israel, Mary personifies in her very person humanity's spousal relationship to God. In relating Mary's spousal relationship with God to her titled daughter Zion, St. John Paul II asserts, quote, As the new daughter of Zion, Mary represents all humanity, called to the marriage banquet which celebrates God's covenant with his people. End of quote. In accordance with this spousal imagery, the Catechism of the Catholic Church likewise states, that our fundamental spousal vocation to God is fulfilled in Mary. Now, and I quote this, The spousal character of the human vocation relationship to God is fulfilled perfectly in Mary's virginal motherhood, as from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It is fulfilled perfectly as the new daughter Zion. God bless. <laughs>